Download detailed ebooks of houses in India with technical plans and fact files. Subscribe to buildofi.com and download one ebook free. I'm Arjun Malik. I work with my father. I joined the practice 12 years ago. We've been working side by side, not as separated partners or associates, which is what I think most practices tend to do. They tend to divide work and let one person handle their own thing. So, you know, architects sometimes don't mix too well. But people find it quite odd that dad and I essentially work on the same projects together. We work on all kinds of projects from, if it's design, right from a doorknob to a master plan and everything in between. This was always going to be a family house. We are four generations. It's a very, very large family and everyone was finally looking forward to being in the outdoors as close to Bombay as possible. So for us, it wasn't really a brief, except that we knew multiple generations and friends would occupy the house at different periods of time or coexist side by side. The site actually doesn't belong to us. A friend had the site he wanted to build a house and he said he'd only build if we built with him. And we'd been looking for an environment that would somewhere bring back the sense of the hills uh, and separate us from the climate of Bombay because we were used to the heat and humidity and you know living on the sea. When the site kind of revealed itself up in the Western Ghats, uh, overlooking uh, Lake Pavna, which is very close to Ambi Valley. Um, it, was, it was love at first sight. It was an absolutely an unbelievable site. Its orientations were fantastic. It had the water, which is the, the lake to the north and east. So if that's our five acre site, right? And that's our main access road which comes through that way from Ambi Valley and goes that way towards Club Mahindra. To our south and west, we have these wonderful tall kind of tabletop undulating hills, some of them with peaks and troughs. To our east, which is I think are one of our strongest natural landmarks, is the absolutely rugged profile of Tung Fort. This is one of Shivaji's old forts. Now over the water towards the northeast is where we start to see the profiles again of the hills and of Logar Fort. So we're completely surrounded by this immense topography. We also have Pavna Lake, which essentially stretches almost all around in the distance right there. And of course, all the, the site itself is quite steeply uh, sloped. The site itself was quite an extreme location. Um, it's very steeply sloped, gradients 45 degrees, 35 degrees, 50 degrees. And we had these two beautiful, call them ravines, call them nalas. These essentially extended downwards from the mountain and is essentially discharged rainwater in the monsoon. This is where the house of three streams gets its name from. And with the understanding of the surrounding, it's very important to try and understand a sort of global section of the topography. So starting up in the south with the hill that starts to come down and then we form what is the access road and then our site has different kinds of slopes, somewhere shallower, somewhere steeper, continues down with a lot of land towards the lake, and then again starts to develop the language of the hills with Logar Fort. So this establishes the kind of overlaying of the site. And if we start to come back now to how does one even approach this subject? 
So for us, the simplest language was to follow what the topography told us and follow what the forts tell us. So it starts off with a ridge between the two ravines, which are essentially the Nalas. The old forts simply traced that ridge topography. So a wall starts to form, that wall starts to continue. It simply occupies the highest point of the site. This is Nala 1, and that's the land, and that's Nala 2. You simply start to build a wall over here, right, which sits on the ridge between the two and it starts to slope down as well, so it keeps continuing, the section keeps continuing down that way, right? Essentially, you trace the topography. This becomes one of the primary fulcrums of the house. So we're essentially dealing with this section of the site. The client's house actually happens further down here. So if you're dealing with that guy over there, what we basically work with is the idea of veranda shelters. A, B, simply establishing flat spaces in the landscape where we can use these verandas. It's a very kind of organic process where we walked over there, we found a gap in the trees, we found a view, we put something flat. So the spine essentially determines how these verandas form. You have deep landscapes happening everywhere in between. So we start to establish connectivity, but privacy as well. And more importantly, we do not in any way obstruct the flow of the land. At its core, this is what the house is about. The simplest way of finding shelter in the landscape to enjoy it without imposing upon it, without trying to domesticate or dominate it, is simply being absorbed into it. So just to try and describe the sheer slope of the site, because even though it's a ground floor house, right, it's actually six levels, because that's how steep the topography is, and there are no floor separation. So as our topography starts to move through, this particular section is cut through the canal that moves through the center of the house, which essentially establishes our complete spines of movement and landscape. So as you can see, as the section line moves through, the house simply follows the movement of the topography and you have your deep green happening pretty much all through. There's an interesting part of the section where as the section moves further, the section actually does something like that. And this veranda essentially floats like a bridge over the ravine and the water continuously flows here. So the topography, as it mutates, so does the house. And I think the other important part about the formation is that when we talk about beautiful sites and homes, shall we say, and you know, wonderful natural settings, we somewhere tend to, in these kind of locations, start to obsess a lot with the panoramic views in the distance. But the beauty of this is that the connections form between the spaces and the immediate greens gives us a sense of the forest almost percolating right through the house. So it's not just the distant background, it's also about the foreground and the middle ground because these leaves are now starting to essentially grow right into the house. You know, the trees are growing into the house. So it becomes the distance between us and the landscape is completely removed. Now, when we go to the major language of the sloped roofs, uh, what we would normally do, if you look at the house as it starts to form, with the verandas and the service areas and the dining and then bedrooms, etc., happening over here. If these were all flat areas, we would simply have put a pitched roof and a pitched roof and a pitched roof that happens here. But the moment these guys start to shift and move up and move down 
and move down and you don't get floor separations but they're four foot, five foot, eight foot separations, suddenly this pitched roof starts to mutate. And therefore it starts to form its very singular language of how it flows over the site. Once again, platforms finding their location on the site, roofs tracking the platforms, everything follows topography. So when we look at the larger language of the sort of flying roofs, it's just a question of putting these platforms um, in between the tree clearings. And first forming the roof in a way that as we see it from the top, you start to see very minimal roof profiles. So they're asymmetric roofs. The idea also was to retain a seamless movement of light and breeze and the continuation of hill through the roof and into the verandas. And when someone's standing here or here, we did not want to see repetitive structural members at the edge of the roof. And that's where we simply picked up from the language of these tree branches and our structure starts to develop a little bit more centrally as these sort of articulated trees. And then the roof overhangs are very, very deep, so my panoramas, my connection to the physical landscape, my connection to the panoramas beyond are completely uninterrupted. This is the language for the main veranda. It extends over to the pool veranda, which essentially is the bridge, which gets supported only from one side and this panorama is completely open. And all of this is worked out with a single detail of a 25 millimeter by 200 millimeter steel plate and compositely working with structural wood sections. And the whole thing is bolted together so the entire mechanism works compositely to support this roof with the rafters, with the columns, with the, 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 the primary members, the secondary members running that way and then our roofs are basically formed of insulated standing seam zinc, another beautiful natural material that is beautifully, it can be worked with the hand. It also has a nice undulating texture, so as it gets wet, as it stays dry, you start to again see this natural weathering and expression of natural material. The rest of it, if we look at the other major material and structural gesture, is that in order to reduce our footprint on site, we concealed two of the bedrooms below the pool. Now, this is a multi-purpose sort of gesture because on one hand, in the summertime, when all the water sources dry up, the rats and the frogs start to gravitate here and the snakes follow and we have little kids in the house. So rather than talking about electrified fences and all kinds of strange mechanisms to, to stay secure, we simply lifted the pool up above the ground. It floats magnificently in the tree line. The branches are now flowing into the pool. My bedrooms form below it. They're simply concealed behind a stone wall. They stay nice and cool because of the thermal mass. And the whole thing works wonderfully and then connects to my main pool veranda that once again opens up onto the landscape. So when we talk about essentially living with nature, one of it has to be about respecting the environment and the climate. We've essentially wired up the bedrooms for air conditioners, but we haven't fitted them out. And in the last two years, we've never had the need for them because the entire house is based on a very effective strategy of cross ventilation. So what we do is you have double layered ventilation panels. All the windows are in solid teak wood. So you have the wood frames with the glass panel, and then you have the wood frames with a composite panel of slatted wood and stainless steel meshes. So all we need to do is keep the glass open, close the meshes, you get the breezes, you keep the insects out because that's a major issue. Otherwise, you know, a lot of people are concerned with the number of insects coming into the house. And more importantly, it is almost a interesting inversion because the walls of most of the spaces become these massive, thick, toughened glass panels. 
and it's actually the ventilation panels, the traditional windows in a sense, which start to read as solid elements within these transparent walls. So the, the play of refraction, of reflection. And finally, as the sun moves towards the south and the west, post 2.33 and all the way to about 5.36, it drops low and the light starts to filter through the forest filters through all these wooden members and then comes into the interior of this house so you have this absolutely magic kind of you live in the light of the forest you live in the sounds of the forest it's it's actually quite magical to be in that place because all all boundaries blur everything unifies